Thank you very much. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Can you guys hear me back in the back at this level? There's like some weird humming that I just want to make sure I don't. If I start to fade off, raise your hand and I'll speak back up. So um, you'll notice on my slide I've got Lawrence Cook up there instead of Larry. I do that because when I was doing my dissertation, the grad school was obsessed with inverted pyramid scheme for all of your titles. And I've become emotionally <laughs> scarred about it. And if I use Lawrence, it's just, it's gorgeous. So it, if you lose interest in the talk, just appreciate the formatting of all my titles. There are a couple where I couldn't make inverted pyramid scheme work, and I'll see if you catch them all at the end. So um, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm at the University of Utah in the Department of Pediatrics. I've been working on uh, probabilistic linkage um, probably for almost 20 years now. And I got started on a project called CODES, or the Crash Outcome Data Evaluation System. It was uh, something that was sponsored by NHTSA, or the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, we ran this grant for 23 years, and it started off with a very simple question. Are seatbelts and motorcycle helmets effective at preventing injuries from motor vehicle crashes? It seems like it's got a pretty obvious answer, but um, Congress still wanted it answered. And so we went to do it. Now, when you think about how you might try to answer something like this, you think, well, no, I'm going to use a crash file because these are motor vehicle crashes. And if you dig into the crash file, I know there's some ODOT people here, you'll find wonderful stuff about the event. Everything you could possibly want to know about the pre-event and the event. You know, how many people were in the car, you know, where they were sitting at, you know, their ages. You know, if they were wearing belts, you know, if they weren't wearing belts. You uh, know what the driver meant to do at the time of the crash. You know how the vehicles came together. You know all that stuff. But if you really want to answer the question, what were these people's injuries? Most crash reports have this awesome five level variable. Um, it's known as CABCO in the crash world. And it just ranges from one, you're not injured, to five, you're dead. And two, three, and four are kind of like, well, you're speaking and you don't look like you're going to the hospital, you're a two. Or you're unconscious, you're a four. So it's not the most specific you could ever want to know about injuries. So maybe you go somewhere else. I'm going to look at EMS. And you get to EMS and you know all kinds of stuff about the patient. Again, you know their age, you know their sex, you know that they were in a crash. You sometimes know if they were a driver or a passenger on a motorcycle, depending on which state's data you have. You know what time the paramedics got there. You know how long they spent in the scene. You know where the patient went. You know all the field treatments, all the field medications and everything. But what you usually don't know is if they were in a seatbelt. And you don't know what happens to them after they get to the hospital. So maybe you decide, I'm looking at an emergency department data set. You get here, if you've worked with billing data, you have something called E-codes or external cause of injury. You can tell that somebody was in a crash. You can tell they were a driver or a passenger. You can even tell if they're on a motorcycle. You have no idea what happened at the scene. You don't know anything about how many vehicles were involved, how many people were involved. You certainly don't know their seatbelt usage or their helmet status. And so we're getting farther away from the original question and if I decide to go to like hospital discharge data, you're like working your way up the injury pyramid, right? So now I'm looking at the very most severe cases, and probably these cases aren't wearing seat belts anyway, otherwise they wouldn't be admitted to the hospital. So if I want to answer this very simple question that we started with, we need some way to bring it all together. We need pieces out of all of these data sets into one final place where we can do our analysis. When we did that, we found out some interesting information. So for instance, if you are not wearing your seatbelt, your odds of dying, depending on the state that, that did the analysis, you're between four and six times more likely to die if you're not wearing your seatbelt. You were uh, two to three times higher to need emergency department treatment or something more severe than that. And then you can see if we look at your hospital charges, well, not wearing a belt, increased the average hospital charges for people in crashes. Uh, by 55% among all hospitalized persons. But if you want to say, well, the true benefit of your belt is to keep you out of the hospital, and therefore you have a charge of zero, then unbelted people had a 400% increase in their hospital charges if you do your analysis that way. So bringing the data together had a huge uh, benefit for answering this question. And the way that we did it is probabilistic linkage. Um, there's a lot of technical math that goes along that Kathleen and Dagan maybe promised not to show equations during my talk. So I'm just going to leave you with my sentence description of it. Probabilistic meth linkage is a method that uses properties of variables that are common to two or more databases to determine the probability that a pair of records belongs to the same person and event and should be linked. 
All right, so we're just going to look at the databases and determine the probability that's the same person in an event, and we're going to merge it. So to sort of get you guys involved, so I'm not talking the whole time, I want to play a game called 20 Questions. Everybody knows how to play this game? Uh, you get to ask me yes or no questions. I answer yes or no, and then hopefully we figure out who the right person is. So I will tell you, I'm thinking of a person. I'll also tell you that person is not me. And that person's not in this room, nor is the person a famous statistician. We've gone down really bad roads thinking it's a statistician. Okay, so I'm thinking of a person. I also is somebody that, that I have to know and somebody that I assume a lot of people know. So let's, let's go around the back. This is your penalty for sitting in the back. And then we'll uh, come up to the front. So we'll start over here. I'm thinking of a person. Uh, that's not yes or no. <laughs> is the person a non-male? Yes. The, this person is a non-male. Yes. It's not Bruce Jenner, by the way. Okay. <laughs> is this person a celebrity? This person is a celebrity. Oh. Is this person currently over 50 years of age? This person is not over 50 years of age currently. This person is living. This person is not over 30 years of age. This person is white. So we have a white non-male that's not over 30. Okay. Does this person live in the United States? This person lives in the U.S., yes. Yes, this is some person that acts or sings. This person sings. That's not yes or no. <laughs> oh, that is yes or no. I don't want to answer that question. Uh, no, she does not have yes or blonde hair. Yeah, go ahead. person is not under 20. Is it a genre of music they sing pop? Yes, this person sings pop music. <laughs> this person performed at halftime. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's Katy Perry. Yay. 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 So, <laughs> all right, so somehow, we both arrived, we all arrived at Katy Perry with a series of yes or no questions, and that's the way probabilistic linkage works. Um, so again, let's, let's play this game again, but with a more detailed example like we would in the crash world. So I've got a crash record on the top, I've got an EMA, a hospital record on the bottom. Um, just a show of hands, who, who would, if you were doing this and this pair of records came in front of you would, would match it. We've got maybe 10, 10 brave souls. Who would, who would definitely reject it? Who, okay. So only 10 people would accept it. Everybody else would send it to somebody else for review. Okay. <laughs> all right, so let's go through and look at this, all right? So um, to do this, we're gonna use something called reliability and discriminating power. These are the two probabilities that run around in linkage. So the reliability is denoted by the letter M, and it's the probability that a pair of records that belong to the same person are coded correctly or have the same value. So if you ask me, is this person, un or if this person's over 30, it's a probability that I think that this person's not over 30. So this, it's the probability that me and you both think Katy Perry doesn't have blonde hair or me and you both think Katy Perry sings pop or lives in the US. Now, records can be coded correctly, but have disagreements. So uh, my name's Larry, but you saw my slide, I had Lawrence. So if one record says Larry, another record says Lawrence, there could be um, a miscode or a disagreement. So this probability is not one. 
Discriminating power, on the other hand, is uh, the probability that a pair of records has the same value for a field given that it's for two different people. So this is like the probability that two records are male. This is a probability that two people were born on the same day. Um, so you can, you can figure this one out based on your data. And you notice that both of these are kind of important, right? Well, reliability, if we're going to get to the right answer, it's important for me to provide reliable answers to the game. Discriminating power is important because if somebody would just ask me straight off the front, is this Katy Perry, we would have stopped. But if I say no, and there's like a whole lot of other people I could be thinking of. But if we start off with, is a person male or female, we're done with half the cases right off the bat. So these both are important um, when you're looking at linkage. So I'm going to go through. I'm going to look at that pair of records again, just to math it up a little bit so that I can have some satisfaction. Um, we're going to assign probabilities to our walk through the records. I'm going to pretend that I've picked out one EMS record. I'm going to pretend that there are 100,000 crash records that I'm looking at. And if I do that, I've got one way to find the right match. I've got 99,999 ways to find the wrong match. So if I just grab a crash record at random, it's really unlikely I found the right match, right? That's sort of my penalty when I begin linkage. So I'm going to go through here. I'm going to compare these records field by field. So I'm going to play 20 questions with a pair of records. I'm going to let my hospital record ask the crash record, is your first name Mary? It answers yes. That increases my probability from 1 divided by 100,000 up to 0 0.0009. So not like anything that you would automatically merge, but you can see that things are swinging in the right direction now. I can ask, is your last name Smith or Smith Sanchez? Um, you know, you can compare these things in many exotic ways as you want. So I'm going to pretend that I'm just going to say is Smith one of these two names. It is. You can see the probabilities are going uh, much more in my favor. I can look at the sex of the patient. That agrees. That doubles my odds. That's nice if you think that the out sexes are equally likely. Now we get to a date. This is the birth date. Born on May 5th in both cases. One says 1944, the other one says 1945. So again, when you're setting up your linkage model, this can be as liberal or conservative as you want. For this example, I compared each field separately. So the month matched exactly, the day matched exactly, the years disagreed. So agreeing on month and day, and disagreeing on year still increases the probability greatly in your factors. In fact, we're up to like 0.15 right now. And you might be at the place where you would say, well, I think it's the same person, but I know that you can have multiple hospitalizations and you can have multiple crashes. So maybe I don't know if it's the right event. So let's look at the event information. But you, didn't, you didn't have any adjustment for the fact that the year was so close. No, but you can't set that up. So I made it hard on myself for this one. So here we are at the year. The month and day agree. I've only, I'm pretending I only have one year of data, so agreeing on the year doesn't matter at all. But you can see now the probabilities, I throw in the event information, is way in my favor. 0.98, but this is the same person and event. I can look at the time. Again, I made it hard on myself. I gave myself a disagreement because the times disagreed. Um, you can see my probability dropped a little bit, and that's because I had a low U probability or a low M probability. The probability of crashing at the same time you're hospitalized is really low. So not too big of a penalty for that disagreement. It happened in the same county. This Weber County is a county in Utah. And now I'm at 0.999. And you notice I made my way all the way through this record. And what I really care about are these fields at the end. They don't really help the linkage model. But this is what I want to analyze. I want to analyze your seatbelt usage, where you were sitting at in the car, and what kind of injury you had. Yep? Yeah. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, so it's a cumulative. So I'm building a case. So by the time I get to the end, I'm at 0 0.9999. So they're based on a, the, those M and U probabilities. Um, you take a ratio of them and add them up. No, this is, so it's based on probability. So every field has a reliability that you give it. And then. Uh -huh. Or you could, um, you could customize it based on your data. 
Yeah, I, I did this one based on my experience with these files. Okay. So they're inputted by they're inputted by me, based on past. And you're right. Um, there are you can do like a whole MCMC fluctuate back and forth to arrive at appropriate probabilities if you don't know. Yeah. But at the end of our comparison, we're right here. It's point nine 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 nine. I don't think any of us are so conservative that we would say, okay, don't merge those records. So, so it, it does actually look a lot more competent than it did when you were just comparing that pair. All right. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about studies that we did in Utah that uh, I thought were fun at the time that hopefully you'll find interesting as well. The first one, with I've had two teenage drivers, so this was really near and dear to my heart. I know that when I was looking at your safety laws, you guys I have all the components of a graduated driver's licensing that anyone would want. Does everybody know what graduated driver's licensing is? Anybody not? So graduated driver's licensing is something that has been uh, sort of swept all the states in the last 10 to 15 years, depending on how progressive your state is. And rather than having somebody turn 16 and immediately become eligible to drive with full privileges, you release them onto the rest of us in stages. <laughs> and so, so for instance, you know, you, you would get a permit and rather, you know, I think, you know, when, when we were young, we're still young, but when we were 16, um, you know, you, you may not even have had to have a permit. You just show up at the driver's license division on your birthday and you get a license. Now in Utah, you have to get your permit. You have to hold it for at least six months and verify that you've had 30 practice hours, 10 of which, which are at night. It has to be signed by your parent or guardian. Um, after that, you have a full, you have a license, but you're not allowed to drive at night. So between the hours of midnight and five, you're not allowed to drive alone. And then, um, you're not allowed to drive with passengers for the first six months. And this is the component that was hard for us to pass, was, was passenger restrictions. And we got the learner's permit phase added pretty quickly. We got nighttime restrictions added really quickly, but nobody agreed upon this. And so we had done a linkage where we matched our uh, crash data to our hospital discharge and our vital records to take a look at that. And one of the things, for some reason, even though this table is really ugly, it had the most impact out of anything that we presented. And this shows simply on the uh, first column here, the, the, odd, well, the table showing odds ratios for hospitalization or death of the teenage driver by the number of passengers in the car. And so odds ratio is a statistics that tells you sort of like how much something's more likely to happen if something's present than not present. And so if the odds ratio is greater than one, that means it's more likely to occur if something's present than if it's not. If it's less than one, it's less likely to occur if something's present than if it's not. And if it's equal to one, there's no difference. And so what we ended up doing was just ranking all the different ways you could have passengers. So the first row shows any passenger versus driving alone. The second row is one passenger versus alone, all the way down to five or more passengers versus four or fewer passengers. Yep? We're comparing it to the adults. So we have the teenage drivers in the middle, adult drivers on the right. So teenage drivers were 16 to 18, adult drivers were everybody else. In a crash. In a crash. So you had to be in a crash. Yep. And what we found is that if, if you start increasing the number of passengers, this odds ratio starts to increase for teens. Um, and if you look at adults, this odds ratio stands pretty flat up until the end. Uh, we were also able to show that things like speeding, uh, running traffic lights, stuff like that also increased with the number of passengers for teens as well. And so this, this table actually helped get a, uh, the passenger restriction uh, passed in Utah. Another, another uh, study that we did is our health department collected a database on student injury reports. And so if somebody was injured at school and went to the hospital or had to miss at least half a day, school was supposed to fill out a report and send it into the health department. But when we found out, we wanted to link it to whatever we had, and so the health department allowed us to do that. This one I'm linking to emergency department and hospital discharge data just to look at shop class injuries. We did one looking at playgrounds and one looking at injuries overall, but this was just shop class. So 
at the time, we only had um, one year of emergency department data when we did this study. Uh, during this one year, there were 167 shop class injuries that caused the student to miss at least half a day of school. When we uh, linked it, we were able to match 45 of those to an emergency department visit. Half of these were related to SAWS. Um, and then we found using the ICD-9 code, 64% were open wounds, there were 9% were fractures. We had two amputations, and this was the average hospital bill for the 45 students. For inpatient data, we, our inpatient data is more mature than the emergency department data. It's been around longer. So we had five years of data. Over those five years, we had 1,000 shop class injuries, which is amazing that there's a class that produces 1,000 injuries, right? Um, out of those 1,000, only seven of them were admitted, but six of the seven were related to table saws. And if you look up the, like the OSHA re regulations, you have to be at least 18 in a workplace to use table saws, but this restriction doesn't apparently apply to high school shop class. So, and you can see the rest of the statistics. This was interesting uh, for me. Yeah? No, I don't know how many kids are taking shop class. That would be a, that would have been a good statistic. But all right, and then um, like I said, the ED data were a little bit later behind the inpatient data. And so when it came out, we were just curious: what is the pattern of emergency department use around the state? And to do that, we did something called an unduplication. It's where you like link the data set against itself, looking for duplicate records. And not necessarily duplicate meaning the exact same day and event, but we were just looking for the same person. And we did this with the first three years of the emergency department data. We found um, that in the three years of, of data, there were 1.4 million records, but that only corresponded to 780,000 patients. And so we wanted to look at the repeat patients. And we found this like Pareto relationship, you know, where a third of the patients generate two-thirds of the visits. And we, looking at them, we found out that patients who are seen at least five times um, end up being more likely to have no insurance. So they're like going from hospital to hospital trying to get treated. And then we, we looked at, we defined uh, something called serial user, meaning that you have five or more visits in one year. And a third of these serial users remain serial users throughout. So there's two-thirds of them had something happen, used the ED a lot, and then went off the radar, but there is a subgroup that, that continued on from year to year. All right, so the, the last example I want to talk, yes, I'm sorry. Are you planning to repeat that after since, you know, Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great idea. So, and we have a lot more years of data, so it'd be interesting to see how long a serial user continues to go. The last, thing, the last example I wanted to talk about is defining serious injuries in motor vehicle crashes. and I. Something that we've dug into because the Federal Highway Administration is now interested in tracking serious injuries rather than fatalities. So serious injuries happen more frequently than fatalities. Um, in the grand scheme of things, fatalities are cheap at um, the hospital system anyway. And so the question is, how do you define a serious injury? And I want to go back to this CABCO variable that I referenced at the beginning of my talk. So this is what's on, for some reason, every crash report. And uh, there's something called MUC, the minimum, Model Minimum Uniform Crash Criteria, which tells you how to collect injury data. And these are the definitions. So killed means you died within 30 days of the crash. A is supposed to mean incapacitating. B means non-incapacitating. C is possible. O is other or no injury. And this is assigned by the police officer at the scene of the crash, who is really just hoping to get the road open again and get people to where they need to be and not necessarily train um, in the uh, Diagnosing injuries, right? Yeah, in triage, yeah. Yeah? So if this is happening at the scene of the accident, why would every kill within 30 days? That's, um, have you heard of FARS, the Fatality Analysis Reporting System? Every state is supposed to track all the crash related fatalities. That's the definition FARS uses. So if the police officer is concerned that somebody may die, then he or she is supposed to continually follow up at the hospital to see if that really happened. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. And when I've, when I've talked to a lot of other states, and in Utah, 
our, our DOT likes to define a serious injury as you're a K or an A. That means you were killed or you had an incapacitating injury. And that's how they decide to where to put interventions and intersections and roadways, how they define their most risky places and distribute all of their money uh, for traffic safety programs is based on K or A. So what I wanted to do is look at, at Utah. Um, way back in 2006, I chaired the committee to redesign our crash report. Our crash report was a Utah invention. Muck had just come out, and so we wanted to try to follow the national guidelines. And so I got the, the joy of chairing this committee and redesigning the crash report. And part of this redesign was redefining CABCO. So we continued to call it KABCO, but we just changed what KABCO meant. And so for instance, the ends meant the same, right? Killed is killed. C and O are the same, but A went from broken bones and bleeding to being called incapacitating. And then B went from bruises and abrasions to non-incapacitating. So those were really the only two changes that happened in that field. But what I wanted to do is see what happened to the distribution of CABCO after that changed. And so um, let's take a look. So here it is. I took the O's out because you know, luckily almost everybody is not injured in a crash. Is anybody here a statistician? Segmented bar graphs suck, right? This is like yeah. the only time in 20 years I found a good use for them. So <laughs> don't, don't put them away and with disdain. They, they can be useful. So, so here's the distribution of CABCO. Um, and again, we were, we were interested in defining serious injuries or K and A. And this change happened in 2006. And if you look here, you can see that, that just by redesigning the crash report, we cut our serious injury rate in half. It's the best public health initiative I've been a part of. <laughs> okay, so, so that's a problem, right? So we wanted to find something that might be more stable. And the one thing that, that you know, being at the hospital and having access to the data and the trauma registry, we were interested in something called maximum abbreviated injury scale. And this is assigned ideally by a trauma registrar but if you have ICD-9 codes um, that are associated with the billing records, you can produce MIAS as well. So we did our linkage, and we wanted to look at this distribution using MIAS. If you're not familiar with MIAS, this is the definition. This one ranges from 1 to 6 instead of 1 to 5. 1 means a minor injury. 6 means it's an injury that you shouldn't be able to survive. And then you can see what 2, 3, 4, and 5 mean. And it's been shown over and over and over again to correlate with fatality. So it's a useful measure to look at. So when we looked at our distribution of MAAS, again, I threw the uninjured people out because they dominate the graph. You can see that pretty much throughout the years, this uh, distribution stays a lot more consistent. So this is something that we are exploring <coughs> as a way to define serious injury with our DOT. All right, so that was Utah. And again, we saw that, but we wanted to, yeah? Did you uh, compare the CAPCO versus the MIAS and see if it was derived from other Right, so the, yeah, you get weird, weird results when you do that. So you'll find people that are A that never show up in a hospital. You'll find people that are O that are admitted for a long time. Um, but they generally follow each other. Yeah. All right, so we wanted to extend the study to multiple states. As being part of the CODES program, our office was uh, the Technical Assistance Center for CODES. And so all the other CODES-funded programs were sending us data. And we wanted to see if we would see something similar when we did a multi-state analysis. So, you know, Utah, we changed the definitions but the reporting thresholds and everything stay the same. But when you go from state to state, they're free to design their report however they want. They're free to determine what a reportable crash means. They're free to do it all. So we were expecting more variation. And in fact, we did see more variation. A lot of people use the MUC definitions, but for these are like two of the extremes here that I, that I pulled out. So C, momentary unconsciousness or complaint of pain. B would be a visible injury. So I guess if you're bleeding, that's what B is supposed to be. And then you can see this other state, A means life-threatening. I mean, I don't know how easy that is to recognize in the field. 
And then C means complain of pain. So they've got the same five levels, but it's definitely not clear that they mean the same thing. So we got their data from 2005 to 2008 to get uh, the same years for everybody. Again, I did the same thing. I took out the uninjured occupants to make my uh, segmented bar graphs. And this is the distribution of CAPCO. And if you see, if we wanted to go A and K across the states, that changes a lot. And you can see that there's a wide variation in the Bs and the Cs as well. So if the plan with FHWA is to define serious injury and then use it to compare serious injury rates from state to state to state and rate you as a safe state or a not safe state, there's problems. You, safe state versus not safe state? Or is <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, so they, with fatalities, you know, you can say, do you have more fatalities than you'd expect or less fatalities than you'd expect? Or how many fatalities per, you know, 100,000 miles? So you could do the same thing with serious injuries, but if serious injury isn't the same everywhere you go, there's problems. And then, Larry, are states penalized or incentivized depending on their rates? Um, I think right now with fatalities, nobody's done this with serious injuries. Serious injuries, the... Okay what's coming down oh, okay. so all right so we did it by MAIS again by states and you can see there is still some fluctuation we didn't get a chance to dig into this to see if it's related to what a reportable crash is or not but at least it's more consistent so the guidelines from FHWA now recommend defining serious injuries by linkage and suggest that by 2020 it'll have to be done by linkage all right so here's a summary, and of course the last bullet's more research is needed, so it's clearly an understudied problem. Okay. All right, and we've been able to do linkage in a lot more variety of situations than just these ones. We've done linkages uh, with our crash data to birth certificates. We were looking at crashes that occurred to pregnant women to look at the fetal outcomes, and um, that was an interesting project. We've done it with emergency department data as well to birth certificates and fetal death certificates to, to look at maternal injury. Uh, we linked our crash data set to bankruptcy claims data set. This was part of the Affordable Health Care Act. Some, somebody was interested in seeing just how many people go bankrupt because of unexpected health care shocks. And uh, so we did that study. Uh, we've linked our poison control database to the hospital and death databases for various um, topics. One was really just to see do people that they recommend go to the hospital go to the hospital. And then also to see if what's coded in the poison control record is what actually ends up getting recorded in the medical record. Um, we've linked our EMS to hospital uh, emergency department and discharge to the trauma registry and the death certificate for a number of projects. I've got one going now where we're going to look at the effect of um, Field, field procedures on kids with head injuries to see how that impacts our ultimate treatment at the hospital. Even things like monitoring vital signs or providing oxygen to see how, what the downstream impact of, of those interventions are. And then we did a study with uh, ETI. So this is uh, paramedic puts an airway in your throat in the field. And I was working with a researcher who was curious to find out if the provider ex experience made an impact on your actual outcome. And with that study, we found a group of paramedics who were like super intubators. They did many a year, while the average paramedic did one or fewer a year. And it turned out if you needed to be innovated, you really wanted to be innovated by a super innovator. <laughs> okay, so that was um, an interesting study. All right, so hopefully now you're completely jazzed and fired up and you're ready to run out and go do linkage on your own. Um, so what do you need? Um, some of the things that you need is you need the data. And, and I can prove theorems and formulas till I'm blue in the face, but if I don't have the data, I can't do anything. And this is often the hardest part. And I was just at lunch conveying to Kathleen some of my current frustrations with, with data. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously you're going to want to take care of all the dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, you want, you know, we have data use agreements with everybody that we have data from saying that they know we'll link their data. We promise not to divulge identifiers. We promise not to um, show cell sizes and tables less than five. Um, we promise to store the data in a responsible way. We go through the IRB at the University of Utah, but we also go through the IRB at the health department 
um, and whatever data review panel any other person might have. We try to, to make sure everybody's comfortable with what's going on. Again, memorandum of understanding, we'll use that too if they want that in addition to these other two things. Once you have the data, you need to have the variables that are common to both data sets, right? So if I don't have anything to compare, I can't do a linkage. And I've, I've been burned on that before, or I got so wrapped up in the first three items, I forgot to look at the last one. Okay. All right, so linkage variables. What makes uh, good linkage variables? Well, it works out really good if your variables have a lot of different levels. Um, and it works out good if you, your observations are spread out throughout those variables, so, or out those levels. So in Utah, half the people live in Salt Lake County. So county might seem really good um, because it's got 29 different outcomes, but really half the people are in one of them and knowing that somebody crashed in Salt Lake isn't that helpful. Uh, you will want reasonable accuracy because we're gonna be judging the probability that this is the same match given whether or not these fields agree. Um, and then it's always good, like I showed in that example, to have a mix of personal and event information. It's hard to narrow down on a specific crash or hospitalization if you don't know something about the event. And then, again, something else that takes up a lot of the time, sometimes more than the actual linkage yourself, is the processing of the data. You need to get things to find the same in each of your data sets. So gender can't be one and two on, on your crash data set and M and F on the hospital side. You've got to put in that effort. And then, of course, you're going to want a way to represent missing this. You don't want to penalize for missing this, but you also don't want to reward it. So there's some of the common uh, variables that we use to link with. Um, obviously, names are really awesome if you can get them. Uh, Soundex is a function that reduces strings to four digits. It's supposed to overcome many common types of misspelling in English names. And so here's my name, Lawrence Cook, spelled the way everybody should spell it. And then the way it's spelled, maybe if you're from England, so you use a U instead of a W, you have the silent E, and you can see it produces the exact same value. Um, date of birth and age are good if you're trying to narrow down on a person. The incident date, if you're linking to a specific event. Time also is really great. And then you can do your linkage at any location level that you might have, and we've done it at the county level, we've linked on cities, we've linked on zips. And you can even you know, get really exotic if you have a zip code or a latitude and longitude. You can draw a circle around that place and look for events that occurred within that circle. Yep. So lots of uh, different ways to go here. The one question I get asked a lot, though, is are names necessary for linkage? Because people say, well, I'd love to do linkage, but I don't have names, so I don't think it can happen. Um, so we had tried to address that specifically. So we all know. I mean, not only are names like really powerful identifiers, because there's lots of levels of names, there's a lot of confidentiality concerns. And so a lot of times people will give you the data set, but they won't give you the names. And so can you still do that linkage? Sometimes people don't even collect the name, and so it's not really a question of whether or not you can have it. So to do this, we did a simulation study to look at whether or not we needed names. And with linkage, it's really important to do simulation studies because it's the only way to know the right answer. You end up with a lot of pairs that look like they could be right. And then when you start like debating the final 100 links with everybody in the office, you realize that we really need to know what the right answer is. We can't just vote on it. So that's what we did here. Um, to judge our linkages, we developed two performance measures. You guys can debate me if this is really the true definition of sensitivity and specificity. If you want, I won't, I won't fight for it. But this is what I call it. All right, so sensitivity is the ability to recognize true matches. Um, that's going to be simply the percent of true matches that I found. So the number of identified matches divided by the total number of true matches. Specificity here is just the ability to recognize false matches. So this is 1 minus my false positive rate. So I obviously want both of these things to be high. All right, so here is my results for my data set. I've got, I introduced error rates into this, this uh, study as well. So I've got no errors, up to 25% errors. This is on a field level, not on a record level. So 25% of birthdays had errors, 25% of sexes had errors, and so on. On the left side of the graph, I've got the sensitivity. On the right side of the graph, I've got the specificity. And for the title of the graph, I've got the variables that I used to do the linkage that weren't names. So for this linkage, I had date of birth, the gender, the county, the time, and the date. 
And then I've got four lines for each sensitivity and specificity corresponding to the amount of name information that was used. So up here, red lines represent linkages that use the full name information. Purple lines represent sound X. Uh, yellow lines are just using the first and last initial. And then the white lines are no name information at all. And so looking at this first graph, all these lines fall on top of each other. So as long as I have the date of birth, the gender, the county, the time, and the date, I, I don't really need the name. This linkage worked just fine without names. If I start to take stuff away, though, so here I took away the date of the birth, the date of birth, and I took away, and I replaced it with the age. So instead of knowing, you know, February 6th or whatever today is, I don't know what today is. Fifth. All right. So instead of knowing February 5th, I just know that this person's 16. Um, you can see that what happens is I start to run into problems with the linkage that's not using names. So it starts to fall away. If I have initials or sound X, it looks like I'm still doing decent. If I take away the uh, county and the time, things get really bad. So my no name linkage drops all the way down to here below my legend. So I'm not doing great on specificity and I'm not doing very well with sensitivity either. And so if you think about this, what I told you about Salt Lake County, if I know I have a 16-year-old male who crashed in Salt Lake on a given date, there's probably like eight people like that. So it's not that helpful. Then this is where the names become really powerful. So sort of to summarize this little exercise, we found the answer to the question is, are names necessary is the same as like every statistical question. It depends. Right? Um, if you have lots of non-name identifiers, then the name information is probably not needed. If you don't, then the name information really becomes crucial. And we dug into this a lot more and developed something that we call a linkage feasibility test. And so you're able to look at the two data sets you want to link, look at the identifiers that you have available for you, and make a decision ahead of time about whether or not you think you're OK with what you have or if you need to um, access more things. All right. So other things that you probably want to link about or think about with uh, probabilistic linkage. Again, we I talked about confidentiality concerns and the importance of IRBs and data sharing and use agreements. Our responsible way of treating data, other people's data that has identifiers, is we create a special table with just the identifiers in it. And then we lock down access to that. So only the person that's going to be doing the linkage has access to those identifiers. All the other analytical variables are somewhere else. Once the linkage is done, we create a new table that just says person one is person eight. And then we delete all of that information from our server. <coughs> um, again, when you're looking at your databases, you're going to want to think about the missingness and the accuracy of what you're matching, because that's going to impact your results. And then you also need to think about when you're doing linkage is timeliness. Your linkage can only be as current as the worst database you're linking to. So our hospital data has a year delay mandate legislatively. So it doesn't matter that I can get my crash data set at the end of January. I can't link it to the hospital for another 11 months because of the way that data set is, is handled. And then also, the analysis is really fun, but it's a lot more complicated than working with one data set. You've got to get used to joins and maybe learn a little bit of SQL programming and stuff like that. All right. Um, if you're looking for software to use, here's a variety of things um, that are out there. I use LinkSolve. Um, this is what the Codes Project used to use. It's called Codes 2000, the commercial version is LinkSolve. Um, Link Plus is something that's developed by the CDC. It runs in SAS. And then Link King is a commercial product. Record linkage is something that runs in R. And R is free, so you can download that and, and run that. Frill and Febril are also free. The F stands for free. Um, these look really good. Uh, they don't appear to be an update, being updated as frequently as they used to be. So I don't know if the support for them has gone away or if they just don't feel the need to update them. Anymore. <coughs> and then you can also write your own. And if you're interested in writing your own, this is a great book. It's out of press, but it's a fantastic book. It's written at a very attainable level. You don't need to have any degrees in statistics to know how to do it. It's, uh, I keep a copy of it all the time. 
And for those internally in OHA, uh, we did get OIS to approve the result. So it's, it was a little bit of a hump that they let us now access it as well as linking. So uh, either if you have your personal PC license, the SAS server does have uh, linking running on it. Uh, you can actually export your SPSS file in SAS. Um, and actually, the assault is access for uh, SQL Server. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the, inter the interface is an access that so you can connect with the SQL Server. And then you can import it into anything. Yeah. I, I use Link Solve. <coughs> I've, I've used it for 15 years now. So, yeah. So, so whatever software you use, you're going to want to just verify that it does what you need. Some of the things that you probably want to look at is what size databases can it handle. Um, Link Solve runs in Access. Access has some goofy two gigabyte physical file size restriction. The software does a pretty good job at spreading information across multiple files, so you rarely hit it. If you do hit it, like Dagan said, you can connect it to SPA or the SQL Server and then run it, everything from there where there is no size restriction. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times, you might want to be want to add your own custom comparisons or custom variable types. Some of these uh, programs are more flexible than others. So if you're just doing common variables, probably any of them work for you, but if you want something different, then you would want to make sure you can customize what you're doing. So I, I presented a study where I did an unduplication or self-match. If you're going to be interested in unduplicating files, you'd want to make sure that's possible. And then some of these allow you to link more than two files at once, which is uh, kind of cool. And then you always want to make sure you get training and documentation if you think you need it. So if you go something free, you get training like it's free. Um, or if you pay for something, the training is probably a little bit better. Okay. So that's everything I have to say about linkage in 50 minutes or less. Um, here's my, my contact information. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that still might be outstanding.